Merry Christmas. Does that feel weird? It's a little weird with the Christmas lights and stuff like that. I had someone ask me, and, and not that it's not about me, but um, I had someone ask me in between. I don't know if you know, but for the last 10 years, my house has been on the Christmas light parade. And thousands and thousands, literally thousands and thousands of lights on my house that blink and drive my neighbors crazy and all that kind of stuff. And the buses would go by. I moved. <laughs> don't go to that house and be disappointed or harass the neighbors. It's not my house anymore. I am now in a, I have like three strings of lights. It, that's all I can do. That's it. No more Christmas lights for me. But uh, so if you drive by there and you're disappointed, that's someone else's fault. Not me. Does someone boo? <laughs> awesome. Okay, like Pastor Aaron said, uh, we're in Romans chapter 2 today, and you really need your Bibles or, or open it up in your app because we're doing a lot of reading. There's a lot of Scripture. Chapter 2 isn't the longest chapter, but there's a lot going on, and we're going to bounce around to other places too. So it would be a good idea if you want to follow along uh, to either some of it will be on the screen, but not all of it. So grab your Bible or your app or whatever it is uh, you, you participate with and uh, get ready because it's a lot. When I say those people, who are you thinking of in your mind right now? Right? When, when I use the term those people, who are we thinking about? Better yet, is it positive or is it negative? See, I think that the term those people is responsible for much of the conflict and the strife and the wars and just the general unrest in our world today, those people. That us versus them mentality is my team versus your team and my town versus your town and country versus country and culture versus culture and color versus color and left versus right and north versus south. It's nonstop us versus them, those people. In my opinion, those people, those people, this is one of the most offensive, derogatory terms I think a person can use because it's almost always used to delineate between us, who is always right, and them, who is an idiot. I think about that. Those people are seldom talked about in a positive light. Those people are ignorant. Those people are arrogant. Those people are brainwashed. Those people are uneducated. Those people are crazy. Scripture says, I'm so glad that I'm not like those people. That was not a positive statement. Last Sunday, Pastor Sean took us through Romans chapter 1, verse 18 to 32. So we finished off chapter 1 last week. If you didn't get a chance or you haven't had a chance yet to hear it or watch it, you can go online. It's on YouTube. It, it's one of the best messages I think I've ever heard him preach. And I did the math the other day, and I think I've heard him preach just a little over 2,000 times in the 15 years I've been here. So that's, that's it's the top five, in my opinion. So you should check that one out. It's, it's really, really, really Good. Now, here's the thing. Something interesting happens in that passage, in the, in the last part there of chapter 1. Well, Paul is addressing the reality of sin and the wrath of God. He's consistently using these pronouns, they, them, those. Let me read you just a little bit. This is verse, or pardon me, chapter 1, verses 18 to 24-ish. But God showed his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give thanks to him. And they, became, uh, they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused, claiming to be wise. They instead became utter fools. We can stop there. They, them, those. So let's step back a bit and, and be reminded of a couple things here. The book of Romans is a letter, right? It was a letter written to a church in Rome, Christians in Rome. And let's also remember that this letter is being read. 
It's being read to the church, just like this, standing up, just reading the whole thing. And we're all listening to someone reading this letter. And I can imagine sitting there listening, they did this and they did that. And those people do that and God abandoned them and all the things that it says in that particular part. And thinking, yeah, those people, they are messing it up. They are ignorant. They don't get it. They don't know what we know. They are totally messing up this world. And what we should do is we should all get together and we should protest. We should get some signs and we should write all the things that we think they're doing wrong and we should get out there and just stand out and protest everything. And just about when you're ready to grab your pitchfork and your torch, Paul yells, you, you, chapter 2. You may think you can condemn such people, but you are just as bad, and you have no excuse. When you say they are wicked and should be punished, you are condemning yourself, for you who judge others do these very same things. And we know that God and his justice will punish anyone who does such things. Since you judge others for doing these things, why do you think that you can avoid God's judgment when you do the same things? Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? But because you are stubborn and refuse to turn from your sin, you are storing up terrible punishment for yourself, for a day of anger is coming when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will judge everyone according to what they have done. He will give eternal life to those who keep on doing good, seeking after glory and honor and immortality that God offers, but he will pour out his anger and wrath on those who live for themselves, who refuse to obey the truth, and instead live lives of wickedness. There will be trouble and calamity for everyone who keeps on doing what is evil, for first the Jews and also the Gentile. But there will be glory and honor and peace from God for all who do good, for the Jew first and also for the Gentile, for God does not show favoritism. When the Gentiles sin, will they be destroyed? They will be destroyed even though they never had God's written law. And the Jews, who do have God's law, will be judged by that law when they fail to obey it. For merely listening to the law doesn't make us right with God. It's obeying the law that makes us right in his sight. Even Gentiles who don't have God's written law show that they know his law when they instinctively obey it, even without having heard it. They demonstrate that God's law is written in their hearts for, they own, for their own conscience and thoughts either accuse them or tell them that they are doing right. And this is the message I proclaim, that the day is coming when God, through Christ Jesus, will judge everyone's secret life. You, who call yourselves Jews, are relying on God's law, and you boast about your special relationship with him. You know what he wants. You know what is right, because you've been taught his law. You are convinced that you are a guide for the blind and a light for people who are lost in darkness. You think you can instruct the ignorant and teach children the ways of God, for you are certain that God's law gives you complete knowledge and truth. Well then, if you teach others, why don't you teach yourself? You tell others not to steal, but do you steal? You say it's wrong to commit adultery, but do you commit adultery? Do you condemn idolatry, but do you use uh, items stolen from pagan temples? You're so proud of knowing the law, but you dishonor God by breaking it. No wonder the scriptures say the Gentiles blaspheme the name of God because of you. The Jewish ceremony of circumcision is value only if you obey God's law. But if you don't obey God's law, you're no better off than an uncircumcised Gentile. And if the Gentiles obey God's law, won't God declare them to be his own people? In fact, uncircumcised Gentiles who keep God's law will condemn you Jews who are circumcised and possess God's law, but don't obey it. For you are not a true Jew just because you were born of Jewish parents or because you've gone through the ceremony of circumcision. No, true, a true Jew is one whose heart is right with God. And true circumcision is not merely obeying the letter of the law. Rather, it is a change of heart produced by God's spirit. And a person with a changed heart seeks praise from God, not from people. Take a breath. It's hard not to read that. It's hard to read that and not, not kind of see it as a rant. Like Paul seems pretty fired up. Like it's, it's, it's kind of sarcastic. It's, it's kind of harsh. So let's get some context here. Here's the Jewish mindset. Jews assumed that they were accepted 
by God through the covenant that God made with Abraham. Hundreds of years ago, Abraham, or God said to Abraham, I will be your God and the God of all your descendants. Okay, and Jews believe that by keeping the law and then observing this rite of circumcision, that was their connection to God. That was their connection to salvation. That's how they stayed connected to the promise and to the covenant. And Paul is saying here very clearly, you have a problem. You have a major problem because you think keeping the law is your salvation. You think keeping the law is keeping you safe from judgment. You think keeping the law is making you holy, but what it's really doing is making you proud. Anytime you hear people use the term those people, there's always an air of pride to it. There's, there's always an air of arrogance, conceit, self-righteousness. I'm better than those people. I know better than those people. Now, okay, so our passage refers to God's law. Jews would have known this as the Pentateuch. This is the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Um, this is where God kind of reveals these rules for life. 613 rules for life. How many of you struggle with the Ten Commandments? Yes, there's 603 more to go. So, like, it, but, yeah, but imagine the arrogance of someone who would stand in front of you and say, 613 laws, no problem, I got it all covered. You're messed up. You're messing it up. But I am in great shape because I keep it all together. This is uh, pride, the self-righteousness, this kind of judgmental spirit. This is what Paul is calling out here. Let's read verse 1 to 6 again. It says, you may think you can condemn such people, but you're just as bad, and you have no excuse. When you say they are wicked and should be punished, you're condemning yourself, for you who judge others do these very same things. And we know that God and his justice will punish anybody who does these things. Since you judge others for doing these things, why do you think you can avoid God's judgment when you do the same things? Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? But because you are stubborn and refuse to turn from your sin, you're storing up terrible punishment for yourself for a day of anger is coming when God's righteous judgment will be revealed and he will judge everyone according to what they have done. It gets better. It's a little harsh right now. You will give it 15 minutes. It gets better. In my Bible, there's roughly eight different occurrences um, of the scripture, God opposes the proud but exalts the humble. And essentially, this is what Paul is preaching here. That your pride in keeping the law is actually in opposition to God. Your pride is in opposition to God. Self-righteousness and the righteousness of God cannot coexist. They can't. Right? Our goal is is not righteousness by our own efforts. I'm going to do all this stuff and then I'm good. In 2 Corinthians 5, a well-known passage that some, you know, some of you may know this, right? He, he is Jesus. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God. So not only are the Jews here guilty of, of the self-righteousness by, by judging others and thinking they got it all taken care of, but they're also guilty of hypocrisy, right? And this is what Paul is pointing out. Because they themselves can't keep the 613 laws that they're supposed to keep, the ones they're using to judge other people by. If we go back to verse 17 here, it says this, you who call yourself Jews are relying on God's law and you boast about your special relationship with him. You know what he wants, you know what is right because you've been taught his law. You are convinced that you are a guide for the blind and a light for people who are lost in darkness. You think you can instruct the ignorant and teach children the ways of God, for you are certain that God's law gives you complete knowledge and truth. Well then, if you teach others, why don't you teach yourself? Tell others not to steal, but do you steal? Do you cheat on your taxes? Do you say it's wrong to commit adultery, but 
do you commit adultery? Are you guilty of lust? Do you condemn, you condemn idolatry, but do you use items stolen from pagan temples? You're so proud of knowing the law, but you dishonor God by breaking it. No wonder the scriptures say the Gentiles blaspheme the name of God because of you. Again, that's, that's hard language. Jesus tells the same narrative in Luke 18, verse 9, and says this, Then Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scored everybody else. Two men went into the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee. The other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this there, this prayer. I thank you, God, that I'm not like other people, cheaters, sinners, adulterers. Certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give you a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dare not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest and sorrow said, God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled. For those who humble themselves will be exalted. And Pastor Sean talked about it last week. The law doesn't exist to judge others by... The law exists to judge ourselves, meaning the law was not meant to be upheld. It was meant to be held up like a mirror. It shows us our brokenness and our need for Jesus. A little bit more bad news before we get to the good stuff. Verse 28 and verse 29. And by the way, Every time we see or read the word Jew or Jewish, let's replace that in our mind with church-going Christian. For you are not a true Jew, church-going Christian, just because you were born of church-going parents or because you have gone through the ceremony of circumcision. No, a true church-going Christian is one whose heart is right with God. And true circumcision is not merely obeying the letter of the law. Rather, it's a changed heart produced by God's spirit. And a person with a changed heart seeks praise from God, not from people. Okay, here, we're getting better. This is the classic religion versus relationship conversation. Right? That's what this is. Religion says, keep all the rules and I'm good to go. Keep them all good to go. Relationship says the rules don't matter if you don't know who created them, if you don't know who wrote them. Pastor Sean said last week, remember this, hell is full of good and moral people because while they knew the rules, tried to follow the rules, they didn't know the ruler. They didn't know the king. They didn't know the Lord of Lords. They didn't know Jesus. They didn't know the Savior. Verse 28, verse 28 says what? It says, a true Jew is one whose heart is right with God. Religion is external. It's all about this stuff that we do, all the stuff out here, external. Relationship is internal. It's all about who I know. Who do I know? Right? So the big question is, okay, how do I go from religion to relationship from keeping all the rules to know the guy who made the rules. Like, what does it mean to have a changed heart? It's verse 28. How do I know if I'm right with God? Big question, verse 29. Back to the beginning, verse 4. Verse 4 is the key. And verse 4 says this. Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? Other translations say it's God's kindness leads you to repentance. What is repentance? Well, I think a lot of people think that repentance is, is part of the punishment. Right? We think it, it's, it's part of the, the whole like oh, divine humiliation, right? This, this whole kind of a groveling for forgiveness. I mean, God knows all things. It's almost as if God's going, look, tell me what you did. Right, admit it. But that's not in fitting with this character. Right? We just read that it's his kindness that leads us to 
repentance. How? We go back to verse 29. Verse 29 says this, A true Jew is one whose heart is right with God. And true circumcision is not merely obeying the letter of the law, rather it's a changed heart produced by God's Spirit. And a person with a changed heart seeks praise from God, not from people. Here's the thing. Fear does not lead to a changed heart. Right? Intimidation does not change a heart. It only changes behavior. It's external. Works with religion. It may work with your kids from a little bit of time. It's external. There's no changed heart there. Love, compassion, kindness, mercy. These things produce internal changes because they change the heart. God, in his love, in his mercy, in his kindness, wants to show you a better way. He doesn't want to beat you down. If you're feeling beaten down by God right now, I'm going to tell you something. That's not God. That's the devil. That's not God. Someone in here right now is feeling that. Someone in here right now is feeling like, God, give me a break. God's beating me down. I feel guilty. It's not God. This is God's kindness that leads you out of this. Sorry, that's a sideline. I felt that. God wants to show you something better. He wants to show you something holy. So if you want to get your heart right with God, then you have to turn in his direction. Make sense? This is repentance. Repentance is the heart act. It's the heart act of turning away from sin and towards Jesus. And this is what set free, what we advertised there in the announcements, that's what set free is all about. It's just the systematically turning from sin towards God. It's an act of repentance. It's a most powerfully freeing, freeing thing I've been a part of, and I've been a part of 19 or 20 of them. I get something out of it every time, and I'm not a participant. I help to facilitate. So imagine if I actually I participated in one like 10 years ago. Imagine that. Every single one, there's always something that I receive from God. It's always freeing. It's always incredible. I always experience God's kindness during that weekend, and I would really encourage you all to, if you haven't gone before, to, to give it a shot. It's a one and a half days out of your entire year. It's not a lot. You dedicate that time to getting your heart right with God. Well, it seems like a no-brainer uh, to me. So, repentance helps us turn our hearts right get our hearts right with God. But okay, how about the next statement? A changed heart produced by God's Spirit. What is that? Billy Graham said this. He said, we ought to be more holy today than we were yesterday. We should always be conforming more to the image of Jesus Christ, and it's the Holy Spirit who helps us grow in this process. So a great way to understand the work of the Holy Spirit in your life, and, and potentially, it feels awkward to say, but potentially measure the work of the Holy Spirit in your life is by the fruit of the Spirit. Okay, the fruit of the Spirit. This is found in Galatians 5. On go my glasses. Galatians 5.22 says this, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. So, how have you grown in love? Are you more joyful today than you were two years ago? Can you say that you are more peaceful today than last year? Have more patience today than six months ago? In a Christ follower, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, it is important to point out 
the order of the words in this scripture. The Holy Spirit produces these kinds of things. The Holy Spirit produces, because I think a lot of times we get this backwards, and I think sometimes it's taught backwards. The goal is not the fruit. It's the Holy Spirit. Like the goal is not the gifts. It's the giver of the gifts. You can very easily pursue joy without ever pursuing God. Right? It's very easy to pursue the virtue of patience without ever pursuing Jesus. The Buddhists have this mastered. There is a billion dollar industry dedicated to pursuing everything on that list completely void of God. It's called self-help. Can you pray for patience? 100%, and you should. Can you say, Lord, I need an extra measure of your peace today? Yes, you should. But we always need to keep in mind that a changed heart is changed by the person of the Holy Spirit and not the gifts or the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The evidence of the change is the fruit. The change itself is the work of the Holy Spirit. So now we get to the question, okay, how do I do that? How do I pursue the Holy Spirit? I hear it all the time, pursue God, pursue the Holy Spirit. But how do I do that? Personally, this is personally, I've been trying, I've been trying to lessen the time gap between when God moves and when I recognize God move. Are you with me there? I hear stories like this, and, and I have personal stories of this, and you probably do too. I have stories that go like this. Last year, I was going through something really difficult. Now, I can look back and see that God was working, God's hand was all over it, that type of thing. What I'm trying to do is to remove the phrase, when I look back. What I would like to be, what I'm trying to be, and I'm getting better at it, is to, to give this type of story. I right now am in a tough spot, but I can feel God working. In this very moment, I can see God moving. And I don't know how it's all going to turn out. Only God knows. But in this very moment, I know he's doing something. I can feel it. I can see it. Something's going on. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to lessen and remove the gap between when God moves and when I recognize he moves. How do you get there? Devotions, awesome. Please. Devotions. Never say not. Find your time. Read your Bible. Pray. Journal. All that kind of stuff. I would never say otherwise. However, I do know people who are very good at their 6 a.m. devotions and then make very questionable life choices at lunch. Because God was six hours ago. That's a lot of time. I have teenagers. That's more than half the day. Like, that's, that's, that's a ways ago. My, my goal is to try and, and find ways to acknowledge God all throughout the day. Just acknowledge God. That's a great place to start. Don't worry about prayer. Don't worry about any of that stuff. Just acknowledge that he's there. Right? Just, just do that. Set your, I've said this before, works. Set your phone or your watch, your clock or whatever to, to notify you every hour on the hour. And when it happens, you just stop for five seconds or 10 or 30 or a minute. And just go, oh, God, okay, you're with me. Just acknowledge his presence. You don't have to do anything beyond that. You can. You get there. But just acknowledge his presence. Sticky notes. Sticky notes in your car and sticky notes in the bathroom and sticky notes in your office. Just find some way to remind yourself over and over, day, moment by moment throughout the day, that God is with you. It's pursuing God starts with just acknowledging that he's there. Acknowledgement turns to prayer. Prayer turns to reliance. Reliance on God certainly sounds like pursuing him to me. It's a pretty straight line. It's an easy thing to do. 
If you want to pursue the Holy Spirit, change me, change my heart. And we can't just leave them at 6 o'clock in the morning. God can't be the Lord of my life between 6 and 6.45 a.m. Jesus has to be my Lord and my focus, and the Holy Spirit has to be my, my desire, moment by moment, minute by minute. How in the world are we supposed to live this life without him? Can't leave him at 6 o'clock in the morning. Okay. So what is Paul telling us here? First thing. Can we please stop judging people and condemning them? How about this? Can, can we just all today agree that we are going to stop using the term those people? Can we just like... Kick that out of here. Start realizing that we all fail. We're all sinners. We're all messed up different ways and same ways. We all need saving. We all need Jesus. All of us. Nobody more so than anybody else. Can we, can we understand that in order to get our heart right with God, then we need to, by his kindness, by his compassion, by his love, by his mercy, turn from sin towards Jesus. And then, by pursuing God moment by moment throughout our day, we're inviting the Holy Spirit to change our hearts and make us more like Jesus. Jesus. So here's, here's the deal. As we close this, I, I want to give us a little bit longer time to pray together because I know you got to go get the kids and then there's a turkey in the oven or some, some, something defrosting or I don't know. So before we all rush off, it's easy for me to say, hey, to, to spend some time today and really pray about what we talked about. Yeah, Y'all going to run out of here and head straight to the kitchen. So why don't you all stand with me now? And we'll just take that moment here together. So first, you can do this out loud or you can just do it inside, you know, in your head, whatever you feel comfortable doing. Let's just thank God for his kindness and his mercy and his compassion. Let's be reminded that God loves you he loves you. Make that personal. God loves me. That should knock you over. God loves me. Me. When I said at the beginning the term, those people, who came to mind? And now ask Jesus, is there any thought or attitude towards those people that I need to turn away from, that I need to repent of? Do I have any attitudes towards anyone that isn't of that list, the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Lord, who have I been judgmental towards? If he brings someone to mind, then ask him this, Lord, how can I humbly repair this relationship? Finally, Lord, what, what can I do 
to pursue you throughout my day? Is it little things? Do I need to make bigger changes in my life? How can I pursue you moment by moment? Jesus, you are so good. And I am such a mess. And I do not deserve your kindness or your compassion or your mercy. Would you give it to me anyways? Which just shows how good you are. So Lord, I want to lean into your love. I want to lean into your grace. We want to lean into your kindness and we want to lean into your compassion and we want to turn ourselves away from a judgmental spirit, from an angry spirit, from arrogance, from pride. We want to turn from all those things and look to you and say, Holy Spirit, would you produce in us as we pursue you your gifts and your fruit of love and joy and patience and all the goodness that you are. We want to become more like you. And the only way we can do that is to lean into you and ask you to change our hearts. So right now, collectively, we're crying to you, Lord, God, would you come into my heart and change it? Change my heart so I could be more like you, so I could love other people like you love me, so I could be compassionate towards other people as you are with me, so I could show other people mercy and grace like you do to me. God, could we reflect your glory to everyone we come in contact with. Thank you, Jesus, for your goodness. Thank you for your love. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for changing us. Help us to pursue you with all that we are. In the name of Jesus, we all say together, amen.